morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at St. Mary's. It is good to have you here. Our hearts are wide open to hear the Spirit of God this day. There's so much in this world today that joins us together, but it's so much that also that we need to be present and recognize the Spirit of God in our midst. So I invite you to take a moment to quiet and to open your heart to the presence of God. Amen. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This is a reading from the book of Isaiah. 
O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made a city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shades of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. The Lord is my shepherd. Your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. 
This is a reading from a letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Erodia and Cynthia to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companions, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guide your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fatted calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone who you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Help us, O Lord, to be masters of ourselves, that we might become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. I once knew a woman, actually the mother of a college friend of mine, who was a gourmet cook. She could take the simplest ingredients and turn them into marvelous, delicious meals. But she always said when she was complimented on her cooking, I hate cooking because you spend all this time and energy putting together a meal and in 30 minutes, it's all gone. You have nothing to show for it. Well, the woman was an artist. She was used to producing things that last things that can be appreciated for a long time. What I think she failed to see is that her meals meant something more than just something to eat. They were an act of hospitality. So the dictionary definition of hospitality is the relationship between a guest and a host, wherein the host receives the guest with goodwill. So to really be hospitable is to welcome guests with both your heart as well as your cooking skills. Because a meal is kind of the iconic expression of what hospitality is all about. And today's readings have two descriptions of meals. The first one, comes from a portion of the book of Isaiah that's often referred to as the little apocalypse because in chapters 24 through 27, Isaiah is talking about the end of time, the end of the age. And in chapter 24, there's a graphic 
description of all of the destruction that is going to occur. And then in chapter 25, we see something entirely different. He starts out with a hymn of praise. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. And then the prophet goes on to describe a banquet. And this is the banquet that happens at the end of time. And he goes into great graphic detail about this banquet. It's not an ordinary banquet. It is a banquet that is a feast of rich food, food rich with marrow, of well-aged wine that's strained clear. And who's invited to this banquet? All people. The reading from the Gospel of Matthew also talks about a meal. This time it is a wedding banquet. Now, wedding banquets were also very special to the Jewish people. And sometimes it would go on for a week. You remember the story of Jesus changing water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana? Well, he, he changed the water in 12 huge jugs that were usually wa used for washing feet into wine because the wine had to last a week. At any rate, in this parable that we have in Matthew's Gospel, we find a king who is throwing a wedding banquet for his son. And so he sends his servants out to invite his friends and the, the people of high standing in the court. And then it's kind of like the, the uh, save the date invitations that we send out these days. And then when everything is ready, he sends the servants out again. And the guests just say, no, we can't come. Sorry, I'm busy. But some of them get violent. And this is one of the troubling aspects of this parable. And they kill the servants. Well, the king is enraged. He's enraged not only because he has lost his servants, but because he's been insulted, the ultimate insult, refusing a invitation to the wedding banquet of the king's son. I think he overreacts a little. Not only does he go out and kill those people, but he destroys their city. At any rate, he decides the banquet is not going to go to waste. So he sends his servants out to invite people from the highways and byways, both the good and the bad, to come to this banquet. Now, the ending is a little bit troublesome. In this particular parable, or I should say this telling of the parable, we have this guest without a wedding garment. Now, normally wedding garments would have been given to guests as they come into the feast. Um, it's kind of like, almost like an apron or a bib. It's just so that you don't drip wine or any of the foods on your regular clothing. And the king gets mad again and has the man tied up and thrown out into the night. Now, the same parable appears in the Gospel of Luke, except it's very different. The king is a landowner. The banquet is not a wedding banquet, just a banquet. The respondents refuse, but they do it politely, even if they do offer lame excuses. And then the, ser the king, I mean, the landowner sends the servants out to get people from the highways and byways. The gist of the parable is that the people who were originally, originally given the gift, the invitation to God's banquet on earth, 
refused to accept the Son of God. And therefore, they will be replaced by others who do believe in Jesus. This is the fourth parable that Jesus preached in the temple against the Jewish authorities. And they knew it, which is one of the reasons why they determined they had to get rid of him. So what does this parable mean to us? Or what do these readings mean to us? Both of the readings point to the generosity of God. An important part of hospitality is being generous. We, when we invite guests to dinner, you know, we don't serve chicken pot pies. We usually serve something that is much more uh, upbeat, maybe roast beef or a nice roast of salmon. We want to show that we appreciate the people who are coming. God is generous. In fact, God is extravagantly generous. Some say, some would say, maybe even recklessly generous. Remember the story that we heard recently about the workers in the fields? The ones who worked only an hour get paid the same wage as the ones who've worked all day. And God has been generous to us in so many ways. And so how can we respond to that? How can we reciprocate? Well, we can't do anything for God. God is self-contained. God is complete in, in, in God's self. But what we can do is to pay it forward. We can be generous to all of the people whom God has created, all of the people whom we see, and even some who we don't normally see. During ordinary times, I know all of you are very generous, going out of your way to help each other and to help the, the work of the church in feeding the poor and the oppressed. In pandemic times, it's more difficult. We have to be more creative in how we extend hospitality and show our gratitude for God's generous generosity to us by being generous to others. Each of us has to find ways of doing that. And one of the ways is by supporting the work of the church. Because the work of the church goes on in spite of all of the various crises that we're involved in. The church is still involved in feeding the poor. At St. Mary's, for example, we do support the food bank. And there are other, other ways that may not be so obvious that, the, that St. Mary's is reaching out to help people. So, what I would suggest is that you get in touch with those gifts that you have from God, your God-given talents and abilities, and try and find what is the one that I am most thankful for. And then find ways of using that gift to extend the generosity of God as your own generosity. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, 
By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. For our Bishop Greg, for our presiding Bishop Michael, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. As we prepare for the upcoming election, pray for that all who wish to vote may be allowed to do so. Pray for justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for all in authority, for the President of the United States, for the Governor of Washington, for our Mayor, for our Police Department, for the Fire Department, for all paramedics and other first responders, for all frontline workers who serve in our hospitals, pray for all who serve the community. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. <clears throat> I ask your prayers for an end to prejudice and violence. For those who protest in the cause of justice, for all striving to end the sin or racism in our world, pray for the beloved community. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and for those in prison. For those who have asked for our prayers, Ruth, Kathy, Doris, Aaron, Annette, Mary, Terry, Eric, Linda, Bill, Ada, Gene, Barb, and Vienna. For all who suffer from famine, drought, or diseases, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find and be found by Him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord. prayer. I ask your prayers for our stewardship campaign. Pray that we might all work together to build the kingdom of God. As we hear the stories of those who have given to build in our parish community, may each of us feel that same call. Pray for our parish. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for the department, especially those who have died violently, who have taken their own lives and for our family, friends, and neighbors who have died during the pandemic. Pray for those who have died. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, especially the Blessed Virgin Mary and all whom we remember today. Pray that we may have grace 
to glorify Christ in our own day. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, the ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another. Let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall, and in their hearts may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their lives, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Gonzalez. I'm a lifelong Episcopalian, and I was practically raised at St. Mary's. Today, I'm going to share a little bit about how important St. Mary's has been in my faith formation and why I believe stewardship is important in the church. As you may know, our stewardship campaign theme is with gratitude, we present our pledges for the Lord. I for one have a lot to be thankful for when it comes to St. Mary's and that's why I'm choosing to express my love and my gratitude through my pledge this year. One of the most important opportunities that I have received from St. Mary's has been the opportunity to learn about service. When I was a freshman in high school, I had my first course in civics and I completely fell in love with the subject. Luckily enough, our diocese was planning a youth pilgrimage at the same time. It was called the Southern Social Justice Experience. It was a two week excursion to the South to learn about the civil rights movement and modern civil rights activism. And thanks to St. Mary's, I was able to participate in that pilgrimage. And I can honestly say that St. Mary's facilitated a journey that changed my life. That trip was the spark in which I realized that all the lessons I learned in church, in Sunday school, in KFC, in Right 13, in VBS, and of course, during coffee hour with all of you, could really be used to make the world a better place. My faith, our faith, can be used to make the church, our communities, and the world a better place. And so my goal after this trip was to share my faith and raise my voice and proclaim the way of love. And St. Mary's and the people of St. Mary's have supported me every single step of the way from sharing the blog post I wrote during my time at the United Nations to taking the time to listen to my speech at General Convention two years ago. Because that's what we at St. Mary's do. No matter the time, no matter the distance, even when we are in the middle of a pandemic, we support each other and we support the church. We help each other and we help the church. We love each other and we love the church. And I believe that this love is a testimony of God's presence at St. Mary's. And God's presence is always something that we should be thankful for. So over the next few weeks, I invite you to reflect on where you feel God's presence and where you see God at St. Mary's. 
and if you're able, make a pledge. Make a commitment to express your gratitude for the people of St. Mary's and the mission of our church. Even though we aren't able to be together right now, we are part of a loving, life-giving community that transcends the walls of our building. And that's something for which we should give thanks. Welcome. Today, as we come together, we remember all of the things that we are grateful for. Um, there's so much going on in this world today that it is a bit chaotic. But I can tell you that there is also much that remains the same. The presence of God in our midst, the presence of God in this community, the presence of God that draws us forward into whatever the future may be, is still very much alive. We have programs during the week that I hope you will take advantage of. You can find about more details about that on our website. Uh, we have morning prayer and Bible study and contemplative prayer, book study and book group. So I hope you will join us for one of those activities. It's a great way to be present with your fellow parishioners and to take this time to learn a little bit more about what it means to be a person of faith. I also want to invite you to really notice how in the midst of all the change that there is so much that, to be grateful for. I indeed am grateful for all of you and for the time we have had together. Um, I am grateful for the sunshine and so much of what this world has to bring. What I know is that in the midst of change, there really is great possibility and opportunity. May not feel like it at the moment, but I encourage you to remember that all nothing is separate from God. So as we take this time on Sunday morning, I invite you to think about what you're grateful for. And as we think about that gratefulness, what we wanna be conscious of is what we want to make sure that is also present in the future. So I invite you to take stock of your life, to look at all of the blessings that you've been given and think about how you want that to continue on to the future. And one of those ways that we ensure that is through our pledges in many forms, be it financial, be it time, be it talent, whatever it happens to be. Anyway, just know that you're in my prayers and that I hope all of you are well and do continue to be in touch. God bless. Amen. Greetings, Diocese of Olympia and all who may be watching. So many of the conversations I have with you on Zoom or online, or if we're truly blessed in person, eventually get to sharing something we did early in this year, 2020, and how all of it feels so far away. An example for me is our annual Holy Land pilgrimage. We actually got that in early in this year, that beautiful and life-changing trip. For me, that seems like it was a thousand years ago now. While we were on that trip, we were beginning to hear of the virus spread. On that trip, as our group made its way through border patrol from Israel, Palestine to Jordan, we saw the first of many things yet to come. A group from Taiwan turned back at the Israeli border because of the fear of what would become known as COVID-19. It's amazing how that has now morphed into the life we find ourselves living. It's not been easy on anyone, but it's been definitely much harder on some than others. Our already apparent disparities in wealth, health, and status have been made even more apparent in this time. Our collective response in this country and the resulting carnage does cause me pause. It's remarkable that just across that Canadian border, life's almost nearly back to normal, numbers far, far lower, and that is per capita only because they chose together to manage it far better. Meanwhile, we're facing a 200,000 death toll, and if things don't change, many believe it will be approaching half a million lives lost by the end of this year, mostly as a result of putting personal freedom first instead of collective good. It's difficult to cut it any other way. Our national response has been dismal. 
in this, unlike many things, we have hardly been leaders unless some of you call me after this. I'm not singling out the president. I think our overall response as a people points to some other serious issues in our collective life that will have to be addressed once we are through this and no matter what our future holds. We will have much to atone for when we are finally through it, but for now, with what we're left with, we must get through it. And as we have gone through it, I have to say how counter to all of that, no matter where you fall politically or theologically, I have felt your response has been you acted as you could and continued to be the church in the world. At least that's what I've witnessed. I made this video truly to thank you, all of you. Both pandemics, COVID and racism, have called upon us, the body of Christ, to respond. It is not always easy to know how to do that. I've been so inspired by the way you, the church, adapted to these new crises and remained faithful followers. Of course, we have many heroes. I think our first responders have been and continue to be my heroes, putting themselves in harm's way, working tirelessly to stop the spread, to care for the sick, to be the human presence in victims' last hours, deeply devoted. I cannot thank them enough. In our church, I want to especially commend today the ordained leaders amongst us. Almost overnight, you had a whole new job description, added task, a learning curve that was steep and treacherous. And yet, what I've witnessed is remarkable resilience, creativity, joyful energy, and resolve. You have truly lived out what many now say, our church buildings may be closed, but the church never closes. That's so true. And I want to thank you, all of you, for your courage and persistence through it all. It does not go unnoticed. I want to leave you today with a prayer that the Reverend Diane Andrews, rector of St. Paul's Port Townsend, sent me this week. She wrote it for this pandemic, and that congregation prays it each week. It's entitled simply, Prayer in a Time of Pandemic. Let us pray. Gracious God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, we pray for strength and courage to meet the days ahead. May your arms of love guide us through this strange land. Teach us the power of stillness and of deep listening. Open our eyes and broaden our vision. Help us to let go of those things that no longer serve us and to welcome new ways of connecting, of sharing, and of showing our love and care for others. We pray for our siblings around the globe Together we walk through this storm, asking for awakened hearts. Guide us, O oh Lord, and show us your ways. We ask these prayers in the name of the one who suffers with us, in the name of Christ, who is the bread of life and the hope of the world. Amen. My beloved, be strong, stay healthy, keep the faith. Thank you and blessings to each and every one of you.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly right and a good and joyful thing to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, journey with angels and archangels, and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves we would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to us as friends and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, May they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and in Christ and in in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Holy things for holy people.
in union, O Lord, with the faithful at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I present to you my soul and body with the earnest wish that I may always be united to you and since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you and embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Let nothing ever separate you from me. May I live and die in your love. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, now, Father, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. 
May God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. the truth.